to use some ideas, and that's where you can jump in and comment on the ideas. We can have an exchange, and we'll just see how far we get. Um, but it probably would take maybe like seven to eight minutes to kind of set up, because I'm a communication professor. So for me, how to set up the conversation is just really helpful. Sure, Thanks. sounds good. All right, sounds great. Any questions from you guys? We good to go? Oh, Alyssa! We're so glad you're here. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad it worked out. The power of Zoom, it is just great. Hey, so Tom, my attitude is, um, uh, I, I loved your invitation when you said, let's have a conversation about this. So it'd be a blast just for us to explore some different things. And I'm not a trained philosopher. I've written two introductory books on apologetics, so I'm not um, a professional apologist per se, but I teach classes on introductory level to apologetics. So for me, how we talk about it is almost as important as the actual content. So I think we'll have a great time. Yep, looking forward to it. All right, so I'm gonna hit, uh, boom, 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 boom. Hang on one sec, make sure I'm all ready to go. Okay, I'm going to hit record. Now, do you want me just to, why don't you, do you want to do the introduction or do you want me to do the introduction and I'll have you introduce yourself or do you want to do the introduction and introduce me or should I just do it because I'm the one that recorded it? Uh, you normally do it because the way I do it, I normally ask my guests, please tell us a little about yourself before we get started. And I usually make jokes like saying I sell bathtubs or something along those lines. So please go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you to introduce yourself just for a little bit. I'll do a quick intro have you introduce yourself and then I'll do my quick eight minute preamble. Sure. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna hit record. Recording in progress. Well, welcome to Biola University. My name is Tim Yoha. I'm a communication professor here. Uh, this is my 18th year at Biola University. For those of you who might be thinking, Biola, what in the world is Biola? It stands for Bible Institute of Los Angeles. We've been in existence for over 108 years. And um, in addition to teaching communication classes, I love apologetics. Uh, I believe in God, I'm a Christ follower, uh, but I'm always interested in having good conversations. And a couple of months ago, Tom reached out to me and just said he loves to have conversations. And would I join him in talking about God theism as opposed to more of a naturalistic worldview, and I just jumped at the chance. I've gotten a chance to watch Tom uh, in his past conversations, and I was very impressed with Tom's eagerness to engage a wide variety of intellectuals and speakers, not just Christians, but philosophers, ethicists, and so it's kind of fun to be able to do this. Uh, we're doing it during one of my classes. I teach a class on persuasion. And my students are listening, and they'll get a chance to engage Tom at the very end. Uh, but Tom, I thought it would be great just to turn it over to you for a quick introduction of who you are, and uh, have you um, introduce yourself. And then I'm going to jump in and do like a five, six, seven minute introduction. I think we'll be off to the races. Sure, sounds good. Uh, I am T Jump. I run a YouTube channel, full time YouTuber, for about five years now. I do debates and conversations on typically reasons or evidence to believe in a God. Also, do the occasional flat Earth debate. Um, those are interesting. Um, I enjoy hearing different perspectives on arguments and evidence. The reason I got started with this is to promote my epistemology, my theory of knowledge and morality. And a good way to contrast that is by contrasting it to religious ideologies, which have their own epistemology and morality. And so yeah, I think it's really interesting and productive to have conversations with different worldviews to compare and contrast the different ways to approach knowledge. Well, great. It's great to have you. And those of you watching might be thinking, I think that guy has a black eye. Like, I'm pretty sure that guy has a black eye. Uh, I was joking with Tom that this is from my last debate with an atheist and you should see what he looks like. No, I'm just totally kidding. I got this from a jujitsu class. Um, Tom, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a communication professor, but I'm also the co-director of something called the Winsome Conviction Project, which seeks to reintroduce civility, understanding, compassion into our disagreements. 
And I've been very pleased as I've watched your channel uh, of your demeanor is honestly one of the reasons that I decided to say yes to your invitation, because I just think this is too important a conversation for us to be yelling at each other and doing um, straw man arguments. And I really do appreciate the fact that even in the small handful of debates and conversations that you've done, I've seen some people really go after you and even try to embarrass you uh, which I think was inappropriate. And I, I'll just commend you on how you responded. Uh, you didn't take the bait. And I thought you did a really nice job of just kind of deflecting that. And uh, so I just commend you on how you have approached the people that I think uh, didn't always do a good job communicating. So, Thank you. You bet. Hey, so let's jump in. Uh, Tom, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, I can. This is a awesome. God question mark. Love the question yeah. mark. So you're, you know, I'm sure you know Peter Kraft. He's one of our Catholic um, philosophers, apologists. I've heard him quoted by some of the people you've had conversations with. I'll just simply point out in a great book called Does God Exist? A debate between J.P. Moreland, who teaches here at Biola University, and Kai Nielsen, an atheist linguist. Peter Kraft wrote the introduction and conclusion, and this is what he said. The idea of God has guided or diluted more lives changed more history, inspired more music and poetry and philosophy than anything else real or imagined. It has made more of a difference to human life on this planet, both individually and collectively, than anything else ever has. If it's a fantasy, a human invention, then it's the greatest invention in all of human history. And Tom, the only reason I bring that up is I think you and I would both agree this God idea has been around since the advent of humanity and really has been a guiding principle, whether it's real or not. It's kind of hard to get away from the God question when we talk about things. So this is, this is to say, this conversation, we want to make sure we get it right. Like this is just too important a conversation to uh, be attacking each other and, to, and not to treat it with the full respect that it deserves. So how do we set up a conversation about something as important as God. Well, in the Old Testament, book of Proverbs, Jewish wisdom literature, I love how the ancient writers say a word spoken in the right circumstances is very valuable. So I'd like to kind of create at least um, how I approach this topic and then offer you some different talking points and then we're off to having a conversation. I'm gonna evoke a Russian linguist, his name's Bakhtin. He has a great concept called already spoken, which means Every present conversation has a history to it. So if listeners in your YouTube channel were to just jump in on this one conversation, in some ways they'd miss all the conversations you've had for the last five years. So I'm going to evoke Bakhtin to say, um, people on your channel have done a really good job arguing for God's existence. And I know you have uh, a difference of opinion about that. But I'm gonna say, instead of covering territory that's already been covered on your YouTube channel, I've decided not to talk about the argument from design, the moral argument, the cosmological argument, the ontological argument, the argument from desire. You had on people, quite frankly, Tom, who could do each one of those much better than me. You know my friend, Greg Gamzel. He was on your um, YouTube channel, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he could certainly do each one of those arguments better than me, but, but it's kind of like we've already covered that territory and you do not find weight in these arguments and I do find weight, but let's not retread that. But I just want that uh, listeners to know that that's in the background, that I do think there are strong intellectual arguments for God's existence. I'm choosing not to go uh, that direction for our conversation. And I also want to mention, because I'm a communication professor, Whenever we do talk about something, we have to recognize biases that are implicit in every conversation. Um, so there's something called my side bias. Two of our top scholars here at Biola University write this. When we hear an opinion that differs from ours during public engagement, our moral emotions alert us to a potential threat. We intuitively move away from threatening ideas and towards ones that keep us and our group safe and we jump quickly to conclusions about the issue, seeing only what is consistent with our position. And I just bring that up, Tom, because in some ways it sounds like a bad joke, right? What we're about to do, a committed Christian professor and a committed atheist YouTuber walk into a bar, you know what I mean? 
is you're committed to your position and I'm, I'm been a professor here for 18 years. I'm certainly committed to my uh, position. I think we just need to recognize that we do want to go where the evidence goes, but in today's postmodern world, I do think bias, we have to at least recognize. Uh, it'd be pretty hard for me to uh, come out and say I don't believe in God because I have a wife who does believe in God. I, I wouldn't be teaching at Biola University anymore, Tom. I'd probably have to go back to modeling, to be honest with you. And uh, I'm deeply hurt by your smile, Tom. I could be a model. You don't know that. All right, here we go. I want to um, focus this for a specific set of your listeners, right? I I'm looking at some of the people that are logging on, and they're committed believers. And I know you have a very strong following of people that are committed. So here's what I want to uh, focus my attention on would be people that might be on the fence. Um, what do you do if you find yourself riding the fence? Is there a danger of remaining on the fence for too long? And how would be the best way to continue this conversation if, in fact, you're on the fence? Um, I want to do something my students do called embodied perspective taking. I think it's important for us in tackling any issue, not just to make it a cognitive exercise. That's what Antonio Gramsci calls the intellectual's error, believing that this is just a cognitive debate. I, I think it's a full body debate. So we have something called embodied perspective taking where I temporarily set aside my own assumptions and beliefs and I assume the perspective of another person. So in one of my classes, Tom, called engaging diverse perspectives, it's a 400 level class, my students alternate between the Christian worldview and the atheist worldview, particularly the thoughts of C.S. Lewis. And I know you're a huge fan of Sam Harris. So we actually enter into both worlds and I do the assignment with them. As much as possible, I adopt not a weak version of atheism, but the strongest version of atheism that I can encounter. And I honestly want to say, Tom, I have a deep appreciation for atheism. I've taken correspondence courses in the life of Camus, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, even Frederick Nietzsche. And then um, in grad school, at least, we studied Foucault. Michel Foucault is a brilliant gay social critic who's an atheist. And so I, uh, when I say I'm jumping into the atheist view, Tom, I'm really trying to jump into the best versions of an atheist worldview, and I've learned a lot uh, by trying to do this exercise. Now, when I do jump in, I'm doing something that I find very helpful called reason to the best inference. This is abductive reasoning. And when we do abductive reasoning, which is we draw a conclusion based on the evidence that we're kind of looking at, there's two concepts that I find very helpful. One is called antecedent probability, and that reflects the likelihood that certain phenomena or facts would exist if a given statement were true. And then what I really want to focus on today is epistemic surprise. That means that if I draw a conclusion, there are certain things that are true that kind of surprise me. I'll give you, uh, for instance, real quick, a good friend of mine who I do martial arts with came home from a date with his wife and his front door was ajar. And he meet totally true story. And he told his wife, go to the neighbors, call the police. I think we've been robbed. Sure enough, he walks in, finds both jewelry boxes are missing, right? That's antecedent probability. The door's ajar, uh, jewelry boxes are missing. I would expect that to be true. But here's the interesting thing, Tom. When the LA police came, um, he had cameras everywhere in the house. So he said to the police, I know we got these guys red-handed. They're going to be on, on uh, film. Well, there was not one frame of an intruder in the house. Nothing. Well, that's what we'd say is an epistemic surprise, is I would have fully expected that my indoor cameras would have picked up on these intruders, and they didn't. He needs to explain that. By the way, rest of the story, three months later, an L.A. gang member was caught. They had learned how to evade the cameras, and he actually confessed to robbing the house. So epistemic surprise can be resolved, but it's surprise. Uh, so when I adopt the atheist perspective, Tom, there are epistemic surprises that I encounter when I'm trying to live your perspective that I honestly want your uh, comments on, and that's where I think the conversation can happen. Does that make sense, Tom? Sure. Yeah, so let's do it. These, these are my surprises, and full disclosure, I'm not an atheist, but I, I do think 
perspective taking is incredibly helpful as we try to understand different perspectives, especially if one is weighty as atheism and naturalism. Okay, epistemic surprises that I encounter. Here's the first one. There's widespread belief in a higher power. This has always been true of us as humans. Uh, of the world's 7 billion people, 84% identify with some form of religion, according to a new comprehensive report on the global religious landscape. Uh, Self-described atheists count for 7% of the world's population, that's roughly 450 to 500 million positive atheists. If you're wondering about the discrepancy between the 7% and the 84, that would be agnostics or people who are religious, but they don't subscribe to an organized religion. Now, what I think is fascinating, Tom, and again, please hear me when I say this, I don't think majority is determining the truth. I think, though, when I assume an atheist perspective, it is surprising that all of humanity, since the beginnings of recorded history, have really subscribed to a higher power, to a type of God or gods, and that that is equally true today. Also, within that group, it's not just the huddled masses that believe in God. Two surprises come to me. Francis Collins is the director of the National, National Human, Human Genome Research Institute. He assembled a team of more than 1,000 highly regarded scientists in mapping the human genome. Collins would serve three administrations. President Clinton said his work should uh, rival that of Galileo. Uh, Galileo. Not only is Collins a scientist, but he's an evangelical. One day while hiking in the Cascades, he encountered God in a dramatic way. That's kind of an epistemic surprise that a sci America scientist uh, would believe in God and feel like he encountered God, he's not alone. If we went to MIT science department right now, 20% um, of that science department, Tom, not just believes in God, but believes in Christ. And it's like a who's who of science. I just want to note Susan Hockfield at the bottom. Not only is she a top, top neuroscientist, but she's former president of MIT. And then I close with this, and then we can jump in and have a conversation about this first surprise. I think Antony Flew's an epistemic surprise, right? A legendary British philosopher, atheist. He's kind of like the atheist C.S. Lewis. And so at the end of his life, uh, he switched over to a belief in God. One of his famous quotes is, in short, my discovery of the divine has been a pilgrimage of reason and not of faith. So uh, again, I'm not saying the masses determine truth, but they are an epistemic surprise, and certainly a Francis Collins and an Antony Flew, I think, present epistemic surprises I'd be very curious to get your thoughts on. So I just turn it over to you, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that first epistemic surprise. Sure. So I'm not sure I would call that an epistemic surprise. I think it would only be surprising if we expected all human beings were perfectly rational beings, and if there was no rational evidence for God, then no one would believe in God. But um, I don't think humans are inherently rational. Most of us believe all kinds of uh, faith-based positions. Um, for example, I think I am the smartest, most attractive man in the world. No, no evidence to support this whatsoever. Clearly um, not true. Oh, oh, thank because you so much. You're a pony. Um, but in the case of Anthony Flew, he had dementia, I believe. So I'm not sure that would be a surprise all that much. People who have dementia and schizophrenia are actually more likely to believe in a God. So at the end of his life, when he had... Uh, significantly was affected by these diseases. The fact that he became a deist, um, I don't think is particularly surprising. I think that given any population of human brains, which are have a spectrum of possibilities, we would expect some percent to go to every possible direction. That's why we see flat earthers. But what I don't see is very surprising is when we, there was a poll done of the National Institute of Science and the Royal Society, the equivalent in the UK, the two highest bodies of science in the world and the percentage who believed in a god was in the single digits there was also a recent poll done the full surveys paper in philosophy that showed the vast majority of philosophers the thing they agreed on most like 75 percent i believe um, were atheists so when we look at the populace the higher educated people become the more prestigious people become in fields that we think are best describe reality the less religious they become and so I don't really think it's a surprise to say that there are some very, very well-educated 
the brilliant people, Nobel laureates who are religious. Um, but I would be surprised if the vast majority of them were. That would be surprising. Same with the public. I think it's not very surprising to think that there's lots of people who are religious, especially if it was evolutionarily advantageous, uh, like it's evolutionarily advantageous to see optical illusions. And so pretty much everybody sees optical illusions. So I'm not sure why I would, if I would consider these surprises, um, unless you only take into account like two facts. Um, most people believe in God and we exist and that's about it. Once you consider other things about evolution and how biases form and what evidence exists and how cognitive faculties function under certain conditions, none of that seems very surprising to me whether or not there's a God. So Tom, being in academia, how would we begin to unpack that um, in a way that we could see and recognize biases, which is part of academia, you have to do what they call delimitations, which is uh, I'm going to recognize the biases I have as a researcher, I'm going to situate myself as an evangelical Christian, but I'm still going to attempt to research something. Um, and that's why we have journals and that's why we have peer reviewed journals to kind of surface the biases. So help me understand why it isn't an epistemic surprise that the vast majority of humanity since recorded history believes in a higher power, that doesn't cause you any pause that it seems that human beings are inherently religious, that doesn't uh, cause you pause? Uh, maybe if I didn't understand or study evolution to the degree I have that might be considered a surprise. But like prior to the Greeks, uh, most people believe the world was flat. There's evidence to show that people believe the world was flat in every culture around the world prior to the Greeks. Um, so it's not surprising that most people believe fairy tales or falsehoods. Uh, in fact, before every single scientific revolution, um, there was something that most people believe that was false. So Newtonian mechanics was widely accepted around the world as accurately describing reality, then that was replaced by general and special relativity. So I don't really find it surprising that lots of people believe something that is fundamentally false. Um, and I wouldn't call them intrinsically religious. I'd just say that people tend to believe things that are evolutionarily advantageous. This was a very evolutionary advantageous belief, and that's why they believe it, similar to any political or social movement. So I don't Given my knowledge of evolution, I don't consider this surprising in any way, any more than I consider um, illusions surprising or delusions or misconceptions, uh, beliefs in ghosts, um, bereavement delusions. I don't consider those surprising either. Um, we know that 60, about 60% 60 of elderly people who have a loved one die will see, hear, touch the dead loved one in some context. Bereavement delusions happen to about 60% of people, elderly people. Um, I don't find this surprising. Uh, whether or not we think ghosts actually exist. This is something that because I know the history of evolution and why evolution gives us certain kinds of beliefs and how the brain and neuroplasticity work, that this is fully explained under those contexts. And it isn't really something that we would need a further explanation for or that the antecedent hypothesis, as you put it, of considering if hypothesis X is true, would it explain the data, doesn't seem to be something that's a relevant consideration given the fact that we have a fully um, explored hypothesis of evolution that explains this data and makes testable predictions that have been confirmed in this field. Yeah, so two quick comments on that. One, uh, no, I'm, just, I'm not representing my university. Biola University has made a strong stance of not buying naturalistic evolution. But you, did you have William Lane Craig on your show? Not yet, no. He has not agreed to come on. He has a strict policy of, he has a policy to not debate anybody who doesn't have a PhD, so. Does he really? He does. Oh, I didn't know that. He's actually, um, we're not great friends, but we actually know each other. He comes to me for advice all the time, Tom. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> or utter hitting William Lane Craig if you're watching this. Um, but he had, he, have you, are you aware of his new book called In Search of the Historical Atom? Sort of. Yeah, he makes a case for theistic evolution. Now it's a, it's a uh, it's a uh, thought experiment. So he he's very coy about whether he actually believes this. But he said there is nothing uh, we can take Genesis and we can take theistic evolution. They can meld together. So Tom, I, I could buy it in for the sake of argument into a theistic evolution uh, proposition that evolution isn't a threat to my perspective. 
but that there are some really noted Christian theologians, philosophers who would buy into evolution um, from a theistic guided perspective. So I don't see evolution a threat to me and my belief in a higher power or a God. Oh, I would agree. So the argument wasn't that evolution is in contrast to God here. The point was that would the vast majority of people believing in God be an epistemic surprise? And given what we know about evolution, regardless of whether or not it was caused by a God, it selects for beliefs that have a evolutionary advantage. It causes some kind of benefit to society. And that's it selects for those whether or not they're true. And so if religious belief had a benefit to a society, then it, we would expect evolution would select for that. So it wouldn't be very epistemically surprising that people would majority believe in God, um, whether, regardless of whether or not it's true, regardless of whether or not God created it. So my what I was addressing there is more the epistemic surprise question, not whether or not it was in conflict with God. Can, can you help me, and this is an honest question, uh, again, I'm not saying the 7% can't be right. Okay, so the 7% of self-described atheists in the world today. But what is it that gives you the most confidence as a minority perspective that, that you are right about the non-existence of God as the 7%? Well, I the amount of people don't really interest me all that much. But again, the fact that 90 something percent of the largest most prestigious bodies of science are all atheists uh, does give some weight to, to lending to the credibility of most experts in every academic field pretty much agree with my position regardless of whether or not most people do but obviously i don't really care about the authorities or the appeal to popularity i'm interested in the evidence and the reason i'm most confident that there is no god is because the evidence for god seems to be synonymous with the evidence of leprechauns or Santa. And I know many Christians take that to be an insult, and it's not meant that way at all. It's the similarity between those two categories, God and leprechauns, is that they're asserting a new ontology, a new property that hasn't been discovered yet. Because properties can fit into two main categories, discovered and asserted. A discovered property is one that has made novel testable predictions that were confirmed, um, that have been demonstrated they are not purely imaginary and that they exist in some respect in the world independent of our opinions. And an asserted property is one that hasn't done that. And the properties of leprechauns having magic and the properties of God being omnipotent, omniscient, outside of space, time, etc., are both asserted classes of properties. And when we try to investigate these asserted classes of properties, we have never found any evidence that they exist. And so that is why I disbelieve in leprechauns in the same way I disbelieve in God. Here's a, a quick question. We're only on the first one. So let's, we'll go to the second one in a second. But how many, you know, uh, you're aware of the work of Alvin Plantica. Um, he's been brought up a ton on your show. Yep. He wrote an interesting book called Where the Problem Really Lies, where he brings it, where he would say, Tom, if he was on this show, he would say, your problem is really with naturalism, of, not, of using your faculties to determine anything about truth. Because my understanding is naturalism is the byproduct of chance right? We're, it's a chance existence that we're here on this planet. Uh, evolution is not guided, it's unguided, and yet you're using your rational properties to determine whether there's a God or not. This is the illustration Plantico uses, and I just want to get your, your thought about it. If you're on a train heading towards London, and you see a bunch of rocks on the hillside that have been purposely put there saying, welcome to London, you could have confidence and say, oh, how nice of them to confirm what I thought was true that I'm heading towards London. But if we knew that there was an earthquake and those rocks haphazardly fell and just happened to form a crude sign that says, welcome to London, because it was haphazard and, and by chance, there would be no reason, rational reason to believe you're actually confident that you're heading towards London. That's kind of Plantica's argument against naturalistic thought process if it's really unguided evolution and that, the, that our existence here is we struck the grand lottery. What's your quick take on that? Yeah, Plantiga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. I am very familiar with that argument. And it's not really accepted by most philosophers or scientists in the field for a rather large reason, which is that 
um, evolution does select for truth. So his argument is contingent on the fact that evolution is purely random, has no deterministic causes in it, which is wrong. Evolution is mostly deterministic and very little of it is actually random. Only the selection features of the changes in DNA are random. But what actually happens after that is very deterministic. So the vast majority of evolution isn't random at all. It selects for the most successful kinds of genes. And the gene transfer may be random, but the outcome and what is selected for is not at all random. And so the argument is essentially saying that if you came about knowledge from a purely random haphazard way, why would you trust that knowledge? Luckily, evolution can't select for certain kinds of false knowledge, so it isn't purely random. So evolution couldn't make you imagine a round square, for example. Evolution couldn't make you believe you exist and be wrong, for example. And so there are certain constraints on what evolution could cause you to think or believe. And if we use those constraints as a grounding point to build knowledge off of, then we can be very certain in our grounds of knowledge and justification, um, even if the process of evolution happens to give us those um, indirectly. So for example, if I smashed a calculator or whatever, say, say I took a calculator, it wasn't working, I just smashed it together, and it somehow happened to work and got one plus one equals two, the calculator would be right, independent of whether or not it came from design or by random chance. The truth of the facts is independent of the origin of them. But you wouldn't trust, I mean, if you smash that calculator and it happened to give you two plus two is four, uh, you're already assuming you know the answer to that. You're, you've already assumed that you know that two plus two is four. I think what Plantinga is saying, that the very rational process you determined two plus two is four, you got from a smashed calculator that you can't have confidence if this is truly uh, a haphazard world that we inhabited via evolution that maybe later became deterministic, but in the beginning, we were haphazard processes coming out of the primordial suit. I think that's Plantica's argument. My right. Point. And that's why you need some kind of a grounding point. You need some kind of a fact that you can verify independently to know that if we can correspond our answers to this fact, then we can trust the whatever methodology we're using. That's why I use the examples of evolution can't make you imagine a round square. Uh, and you can't believe you exist and be false. So because we have these answers, these are like the one plus one equals two, two plus two equals four kind of a thing. And we can use those concrete, definitely can't be wrong answers to build off of to get more complicated grounds of knowledge. So the solution to Plantinga's evolutionary argument is that evolution does select for truth in certain contexts because it's actually impossible for it not to. It can't make you imagine a round square. It can't make you believe you exist and you be wrong. Okay, so let, let, that's my first epistemic surprise. Um, great conversation. Let me do my second one. I, I honestly want to get your thoughts on this. So surprise number two, children seem to be predisposed to believe in God. Because, because I agree with what you've said in previous debates, that for sure you can be socialized into a belief in God, right? Absolutely, I've seen that happen. But notice this study from the University of Oxford I find fascinating. A three-year international research project directed by two academics at the University of Oxford finds that humans have natural tendencies to believe in gods and an afterlife. The project involved 57 researchers who conducted over 40 separate studies in 20 countries representing a diverse range of cultures. Now let's tip our cap to Oxford. They're pretty good at doing this. So they understood we're not going to cherry pick the countries, right? I, I, I get that. You go to a, a, a naturally religious country, you're going to get uh, socialization. But notice that they knew to, not to do that. And they went to both religious and atheist countries but they found that children in and of themselves had a propensity towards a belief in an afterlife, a belief in a higher power, and even an inherent desire to communicate what we call prayer. So Tom, you can imagine some atheist parents pulling their hair out, going, wait a minute, they're not getting this from my house. They're not getting it from our friends. They're not getting it from school. Where in the world are these kids getting this predisposition to believe in a higher power, I, I, I at least find that an epistemic surprise that in atheistic countries, children seem to be predisposed towards a belief in a higher power. Um, so when I adopt a atheistic perspective, 
I find that kind of interesting and a bit of a surprise to me. Your take? I, I'm not sure why it would be a surprise because all human beings have a prevalence towards um, cognitive biases, fallacies, illusions, delusions, misconceptions in the tens of thousands. Um, kids also have a prevalence for imaginary friends. That's also pretty common among for, uh, children. And among all humans, there's a specific type of cognitive bias called type one and type two errors, false positives and uh, false negatives, where like if you see a rustle in the bushes and you think I'm going to be super scientific and skeptical and not uh, assume a conclusion before evidence and it happens to be a lion, well, you get eaten. But if you assume it's a lion every single time and run away, um, you're more likely to survive. And so the evolution would then in this case select for the people who would always think it's a lion or a demon or an evil spirit of some kind and run away over the super skeptical, rational, I'm going to wait for evidence kind of people because it's better for survivability to give people the prevalence to always assume there is an agency behind the unknown. So it's called the hyperactive agency detection uh, bias. And so the fact that children will think there's a monster under the bed or will think that there's imaginary friends or will think there's a bad guy in the in the shadows, all of these are natural human inclinations that's a product of evolution, which are the exact same kind of inclination that is used for a higher power. And so I don't find this surprising any more than I find it surprising that children will see optical illusions. Like if you have seen the Rubik's Cube optical illusion where they have uh, an orange square in the middle of the top and the side of the Rubik's cube, and one looks a little darker than the other, but when you remove all the background, they're the exact same color. That optical illusion is present in all humans just because of how our uh, optical nerves work. And because these kinds of things are a product of evolution, I don't find it surprising at all that people have these. I find it like it would be surprising if people didn't have these. And so in the context of belief in a God, I would find the same thing. If there was a group of people who did not have a predisposition for type one and type two errors, I would be very impressed. I think that's very strange. Um, so I'm not particularly surprised by this fact. So what's the evolutionary advantage today of a belief in gods? What's the evolutionary advantage? Well, today evolution doesn't really take place anymore because we've been artificially um, keeping people alive. So natural selection isn't really an issue anymore because we have drugs and things to keep people alive who aren't as genetically fit, if you want to call them that. And so uh, evolution takes hundreds of thousands to millions of years to see any kind of selection factor take place. And so there, we have lots of things that are were advantageous in the past, but don't really have any benefit today. So what evidence would you accept from an, from an academic standpoint, the existence of God. What would, what would be the academic study and the parameters of that study that would lead you to at least suspect that there could possibly be a God? What would be the parameters of that study? Any novel testable predictions. So- oh, say, that, I'll say that so quick. Say that again, Tom, I missed it. Novel testable predictions. It's the same standard we use in all of science, essentially. Um, if you want to say, I believe, this is a crude example, so don't think I'm exclusively requiring this example. It's just the first thing that comes to mind whenever, whenever someone asks me this question. If I believed in a God named Bob, and Bob told me in a dream that every time I pray to him and ask for a gold brick, he will give me a gold brick. And I pray to him and a gold brick appears and I sell it at the bank and get a million dollars. That is phenomenal evidence. It is a novel testable prediction to explain a phenomenon that is not predicted by any other hypotheses as far as we can know yet. It is accurate. It is testable. It is repeatable. Perfect evidence. Another example that would be more um, cogent would be like if we die and go to heaven. Um, in the Bible, it says if once you die, you'll go to the gates of heaven and God will judge you, send you to heaven or hell. If that happens, that's great evidence. It's a testable prediction. The things in Revelation, there are predictions in Revelation about what will happen in the future. If those happen, those would be great evidence. Like if a quarter of the Christian population just magically disappeared and their clothes landed on the floor, phenomenal evidence of Christianity. Any of these would be great evidence. I think I do want to give one other example, which is from Hinduism. In Hinduism, in the Vedas, it predicts the age of the earth is 4.3 billion years old. And that's really close, 95% accuracy. That's real evidence. So I don't think it's very good. I think they just got a lucky guess. But that's real evidence. If the holy book, any particular holy book, was able to make predictions about things that would get learned in the future and got it correct, DNA is a double helix, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, et cetera, et cetera. Those are phenomenal examples that would be evidence that the particular 
proposition being expressed in the holy book was correct. But Tom, can I, can I push back on that just a little bit? I, I found it interesting what you just said. You said that according to the Vedas, roughly the earth was what, 4.8 billion? 4.3 billion, the earth, yes. And you actually said, that's, that's not bad. That's actually pretty close, but you discounted it. Do, do you see how, it, where I'm standing, that's kind of your bias coming in a little bit to say, hey, that was close, and that a religious text um, asserted that, but you're discounting it. I'm confused why that was discounted when they actually were pretty close. And again, we'd have to have margin of error on the age of the earth. I mean, there's no absolute consensus on the age of the earth. Why discount that? Well, I don't. That is, that's like the best evidence I think there is for God. I don't discount it. I don't think it's sufficient. I think it's insufficient evidence, but I think it's the best evidence we've got from any religion. Okay. Can I, can I ask why it wasn't sufficient? Um, because it could just be a lucky guess. And there are lots of other guesses that are incorrect in the book. And so if it had 100% of its guesses were accurate, that would be great evidence. Just having one be accurate and a whole bunch be inaccurate is not, not great evidence. Um, and just having one guess and literally nothing else is not great evidence. And so what you would want is a consistency. You'd like, you'd like a bunch of very specific, accurate guesses, and that would be strong evidence of the conclusion. Just having one, it could just be a lucky guess because every holy book has a particular number they assign to the age of the earth in one way or another. And so we would expect, given the 30,000 or so religions that we know of, one of them is probably going to get close. And so it's not a particularly good piece of evidence. What we would need is a, a lot of those examples in the holy book. So I, I appreciate the scientific rigor by which you approach these things. But, but sound back to the epistemic surprise of, of Francis Collins, Tom, or MIT's Right? Because in a weird way, Tom, if we were picking a basketball team, right? remember, remember in uh, those horrible experiences you had in junior high where they were picking a basketball team and you got picked last, or I know at least I did. I'm a wrestler, so nobody ever picked me for basketball. I'm 6'2", so I was, I was like the winner. Are you 6'2"? Yeah. Wow, you, get, you were the kids I didn't like. You yep. were the one who got picked first. Yep. I was a wrestler, Tom. If I hit the backboard with the basketball, I got really excited. If it made a loud noise. Okay, so I do want to say, I will let you pick among the NBA if I could pick five players. And I'm going to pick Kevin Durant, LeBron James. I'm going to pick Curry. So guess what? You can have the NBA. I'm picking my five. And thank you very much. I think my five are going to do exceptionally well against the NBA. So I'm a little concerned with, I think an epistemic surprise is Leibniz. I think an epistemic surprise are, are some of the great philosophers so, uh, who, who have believed in a higher power and a Francis Collins who applies as stringent a scientific process as possible to arrive at his conclusions. I mean, he, he, he would sit and, and embarrass both of us with the scientific rigors of how do you actually present and the verification principle being used. So I, I'm a little concerned by just saying the British Philosophical Society that you mentioned, there are noted exceptions to that rule. I think you would agree with that, right? There are some heavyweights. The last is, of your account number followed by the pound sign. Is, uh, sorry, somebody, I heard like a something, something account number, pound sign, but. Right, that was the Holy Spirit saying, I'm right, Tom, and you're wrong. <laughs> I don't know if you were able to interpret that, but no, but, but, you, but um, to me, the epistemic surprise is, man, there are some heavyweights of philosophy, science, any discipline you pick, there are heavyweights that believe in a higher power or believe in God. To me, at least, that's an epistemic surprise. It, does, it makes sense in my worldview and um, that children are predisposed, it reflects what Jesus said, suffer the children to come to me. Do, do not keep children coming. It seems to me that it makes sense that God would be reaching out to children because of his love for humanity. But that's, that's my second epistemic surprise. Uh, one last comment before I go to the next one. Uh, do you, were you asking for me to comment on that? Only if you had one. I'm going to go. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't I don't see that as very surprising any more than it's surprising that Isaac Newton believed or that Einstein believed in a steady state universe or Isaac Newton believed in alchemy or that um, the prominent scientists believe in the, the ether theory, which was wrong, or that many scientists always have their pet theories. Many of the most best accredited, most intelligent men in the world believe theories like phrenology, uh, all kinds of things that were just demonstrably wrong. But because they're human, that's not, I don't find that surprising. Like, why would the fact that many of the smartest people believe in God be any more surprising than the smartest people believing in the ether theorem, which was wrong? They all have particular biases. And the whole point of science is that the peer review process, as you mentioned, is when you take your biases, you put them into a paper, try to remove all of the things that are clearly bad arguments, that are clearly fallacious, present only the best evidence you can, and then provide it to the other scientists who each have their own particular bias. And they hate your bias because they want them to be right and you to be wrong. And so they're going to do everything they can to destroy your paper with their biases. And the what makes a good paper is one that no matter how hard the other people with their biases try, they can't beat your evidence. It's so good, they can't beat it. And so I'm not surprised that scientists have their own biases and that a minority of scientists happen to have one particular bias as opposed to another. You know, that's what the EPR, many worlds theory is. I don't really like that theory very much. Lots of scientists like that theory. Um, every scientist likes to have their particular theory that fits their intuitions best. But the reason we have the peer-reviewed process is to omit those biases and only leave the best evidence. And I'm not surprised by theists having a particular bias. They're being very brilliant theists because the fact that they can't publish it in the paper and get it passed in science is conforming of what I would expect of a bias that doesn't really have any real supporting evidence like phrenology or ether theory or EPR. Like everybody gets their own bias, but it would only be surprising if you could publish it in the paper and get like some real good evidence there. Okay. I, I think if you look at the beta of Francis Collins, I think you would see the top peer reviewed journals in the entire world allowing his argument. Not, not saying it's right, but allowing his argument. I mean, he's, he's got peer reviewed in every which way you can. I mean, take a look at Alvin Plantinga. I mean, he's, he's published in some of the top philosophical journals that you can imagine. So my only point being, Tom, is I, I think you would agree with this. Tell me if you don't. I can't prove God exists and you can't prove he doesn't. Well, I would agree with some versions. So there are some versions of God that I think have logical contradictions and those you can prove don't exist. Okay. But you would say ultimately it'd be pretty hard to just prove all conceptualizations of God. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, good. Because remember, my audience is those on the fence. That's kind of, I'm kind of keeping my... Um, North Star, those individuals. But let's go on to number three. Surprise number three. And this is just me, Tom. Um, when I assume the atheist perspective, it doesn't seem like I fit in this world. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I'm a huge fan of Lewis. Lewis said this, do fish complain of the sea for being wet? Or if they did, would that fact itself not strongly suggest that they had not always been or would not always be purely aquatic creatures. So if I am made for this world, right, either a byproduct of evolution, um, there is no God, there is no higher power, then I would feel a certain fittedness in this world. And when I assume the atheist perspective, I don't feel that fittedness. And let me give you a couple examples. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, I don't know if I have, if sound will work. Let me give you a, a shot to see if this will actually play. So Tom Freud would say, make peace with that, right? It, it is a natural part of life and we shouldn't fear death per se. Thomas Nagel, who I think is a brilliant writer, atheist uh, philosopher, would say, if non-existence never bothered you, the fact that you never existed, then why should it bother you that you will also not exist in the future. But Tom, what I find is that we do resist death. So I want to show you this commercial. Uh, hopefully this is going to work. Give me a thumbs up, Tom, if you, if you have sound, okay? So here we go. 
I'm a hospice nurse. Berta Olson is my patient. I spend long hours with her, checking her heart rate, administering her medication, and just making her comfortable. One night, Berta told me about a tradition in Denmark. When a person dies, she said, someone must open the window so the soul can depart. I smiled and squeezed her hand. Not tonight, Berta. Not tonight. Now, Tom, here's what I find interesting about that. That is a hospice nurse, right? A hospice nurse is supposed to help us um, come to terms with death. And so it's interesting that there's this beautiful, right, cultural expression that you open the window and the hospice nurse wants to close. I think most people would be with Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentlemen through that dark night, but to fight against it. So if death, is part of the human experience as natural as life, then why do I find that most in rail against it? That doesn't seem like a fittedness. If this life is all there is, why am I railing against something that is as natural as being born? Well, we don't like disease either, and we also rail against that. Um, so I'm not, I don't quite understand the argument. It seems like you're saying, because we don't like death, there must be an afterlife or something. Um, there's lots of things we don't like. I don't like that my bank account doesn't have a million dollars in it. Does that mean that there's going to be a secret million dollars planted? No, not unfortunately not. Uh, life is not particularly fair in many cases. Many people don't like the lives they're given. I imagine like the tens of thousand people who starve to death every day. Um, that doesn't mean that because they don't like it, there is necessarily going to be a solution to their problems. Um, I, I, it would be nice if that was the case, uh, but I did want to go back to what you mentioned earlier that you said you don't feel like you fit in an atheistic universe. I believe that was something along those lines. Um, the general atheism doesn't posit anything. Uh, it doesn't say there is or isn't meaning just as no God essentially. And there are many atheistic models such as the Buddhist model who believes there are kinds of afterlives or like a field of purpose and meaning out there, the karma field. And in such a universe, we humans do have purpose and meaning given to us without a God. And so from my perspective, anybody could make up a hypothesis that could make us get this feeling of belonging by saying that there is this ultimate force in the universe that imparts meaning and value universally to all beings. Um, but the typical like naturalistic perspective is like we shouldn't go beyond the evidence and only assert things that if they can have a justifiable basis to show it's not just our imagination kind of a thing. Um, and so I don't see a problem with if you want to, from the theist perspective, believe there is a God and say this God gives us meaning. The atheist could just do the same thing and say we believe in this, there's this field and it gives us meaning. And so our worldview could also give you that same sense of value. Um, but from my perspective, I don't like to go beyond the evidence. So I would not, I would not advocate for such an approach, but I don't think there is an advantage on the atheist versus the aside to being able to give us that sensation of value, purpose in the universe. Okay. Fair enough. Can you go back? I wish we could rewind this just a, a minute. You gave a description of naturalism, of what naturalists do that they, you said something like, do not go beyond the evidence. Okay, beyond the evidence. Okay, can I give you my second one that to me just doesn't seem to fit, okay? Sure. So, um, the evidence clearly shows we're a warlike people. I mean, that is, uh, you can go back to ancient civilization, ancient writings, and we are warlike people. Ernst and Trevor Dupai are two of the most famous military historians, their brother, uh, brothers, they said this, the dawn of history and the beginning of organized warfare went hand in hand. Wayne Dyer in his haunting documentary War said, we must consider an unwelcome possibility that war is the inevitable accompaniment of any human civilization. So applying what you just said about naturalism, we just backed it up like that 40 seconds, then we should just embrace the fact that we are warlike people. It, it has been true since the dawn of society. The minute we created tools to garden, we use those tools to kill each other. So that's the uh, professional opinion of Ernst and Trevor Dupai. So Tom, why not accept the fact that we are just simply warlike people? Because I don't think you accept that because you, I remember your um, 
moral your, realist. Is any imposition of the will upon another person is you think that that's objectively wrong, right? Yeah. Okay, but, but go back to your naturalistic assumption for a second. I, I mean, I, I think you're going to accept that we've been a warlike people ever since the advent of humanity. Why is that not just us accepting who we are? And I have a ton of empirical fact, and we could turn on CNN right now and see that the doomsday clock uh, created by Albert Einstein and a uh, scientist from the University of Chicago who worked on the bomb, you know, they just reset the doomsday clock. Uh, when we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest we've ever come to launching nuclear missiles at each other, it was seven minutes to midnight. It is now 100 seconds to midnight, the eradication of the human race. So Tom, I think history is overwhelmingly on my side. We are a warlike people. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was technically the third closest we got because there was two times where we actually did it. Um, but well, I, the eradication of the planet is what midnight is. It's yeah. the it games up, we're done as a human race. But the fact that we're acknowledging facts about how evolution works is completely separate from prescriptions about what we should be. So I can acknowledge, yes, we are a warlike people, but acknowledging that fact doesn't imply that we should therefore not try to change it, which I think is the argument you're trying to make. You're, you seem to be saying that in the past, we've always been warlike and therefore we shouldn't try to change it or something along those lines, or is that's the implication I think you're trying to make, which are two separate things. That's the is ought distinction from uh, uh, David Hume, I believe is ought distinction. So the fact that we can acknowledge the factual case that we are warlike people doesn't entail that we therefore ought not change it or something along those lines. So I can acknowledge fully, yes, we are more like people, but if there does happen to be another fact of the universe, like there is a, a universal standard of morality and the best way the world could be, um, then we can still try to get closer to that um, while still acknowledging the flaws in our nature at this point. And I would like to point out there are many cultures who are not more like, like the Jains. Jains are extremely pacifistic they're the most pacifistic i think the most moral of all possible religions as far as i know um where they have an extreme position of nonviolence, where they're going to like put a cheesecloth over their mouth to make sure they don't accidentally eat a fly when eating because killing any life is is wrong and so i think that the fact that most human societies have been more like is also a product of evolution just because it's been advantageous but doesn't in any way entail that we can't desire to try to change that yeah, but, oh, but, but Tom, honestly, this is my big question for you. I, 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 I agree that we ought to change it. We ought to work towards changing it. We, we tried to do that. Wars, to end all wars, the UN, NATO. But, but help me understand what criteria or, or rule book are you appealing to to look at something that has always been true of humanity, war, and you're saying, but we ought to try to change that. But 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 it's been part of our DNA. Empirically, it's been part of our DNA. And so why evoke now a, a criteria by which we should change it, imposition of the will against another person? I guess I'm confused where you're getting that criteria from to say the war likeness is not part of the human DNA. Why, why try? And there's a ton of evolutionary benefit to war. I mean, ask the Russians, they have a ton of reasons they want Ukraine right now. So help me understand where you're getting this external rule book to judge war. Um, well, there's a, a very well-developed academic field called moral philosophy. Um, surprisingly, oh, what? what? Again, real quick, if you were, uh, there's a well-developed academic field called moral philosophy. Uh, and among moral philosophers, most are atheists, surprisingly, the poll 20, 2022 Phil Surveys paper, I believe. Um, most Christians don't know this, but most atheist academic philosophers are moral realists. They believe in objective morality because you don't need a God to, to ground objective morality. You can do it in nature. It's called moral naturalism. It's the position I, I like. And in this field of moral philosophy. We use different lines of evidence, including moral progress, moral intuition, the philosophical dilemmas, like the is ought problem, um, G.E. Moore's open question argument. Uh, we use different kinds of philosophical trolley problems, those kinds of things, to assess how moral intuitions uh, map onto 
society and how it's changed over time as we've gained more intellectual and resource availability. And we use these to try to map out a model of where we think morality is progressing to based on our experience. And we think this may or may not correspond to some independent factor of the universe, platonic objects, AP or abstracts, laws of physics. There's lots of possibilities. This is not a discovered thing. We haven't discovered it yet. But there is lines of evidence that we can use to infer this. And that seems to be a much better basis to understand what morality is than asserting a God to do so. But Tom, I would, I would push back a little bit on this moral progress idea. So I teach a gender class. I also teach self-defense at domestic violence shelters here in the United States. And with the Graceful Warrior Project, travel in places like uh, Tanzania and work with Maasai women. So Tom, I, I, I guess I'm not optimistic about your moral progress in the fact that there are more slaves based on Amnesty International. There are more slaves alive. There are more slaves today than any point in human history. Um, particularly children and particularly women. Women are at more risk today than at any point in human history. More women have gone missing today than adding up all the bloody conflicts of the 20th century. LGBTQ rights, right, uh, um, are not advancing as much as you would want them to be and actually decreasing in the United States. So what gives you the confidence of this moral progress when I'm looking at a world that I don't think is showing the type of more, and, and my gosh, race relations. We are in a devastating time of, of I think, race relationships. And I think um, people, uh, Black Lives Matter would say, we're in a race quake right now. So wh where is this moral progress that gives you confidence that your, your moral naturalism is moving in the right direction? Well, uh, when we're assessing evidence in the scientific field, we don't just base it on the cumulative amount of things occurring. We also base it on the population. So if we want to know, are people getting better? We want to know, are pe like of a hundred, given a hundred thousand people, how many people are murderers? And if that number goes down over time, then less people are becoming murderous. So because the population is now at about 7 billion, which is significantly higher than it's ever been, the global population is increasing exponentially. Um, the the fact that there are more murders today is it doesn't really tell us anything what we want to know is are there more murders relative to the amount of population and when we do that data there have been a number of studies on the here one is a great book by steven pinker the better angels of our nature where he goes through statistically on dozens of these statistics everyone you can think of uh, death rate child mortality rate um, violence in the home rates murder uh, burglary everything you can think of and of all of those statistics when we compare them, even including some of the worst things, World War II, Soviet Union, uh, we're still significantly better off per the global population than what we were in the past. Before, many more people were violent. Many more people died prematurely. Life expectancy was about a third of it what it is today. Um, more child mortality rate was significantly four or five times higher than it is today. Um, before, you had a 50-50% chance of being treated by a doctor. Uh, there, We can... You mentioned LB, LGBTQ rights. Today, they actually have those. They didn't in the past. If you don't recall, the 1950s, it was a crime to be gay in, in the UK. That's why one of the most prominent scientists, Alan Turing, was put to death, essentially, be, by being forced to take arsenic, I believe, because he was gay. That doesn't happen anymore. That's I think I'm pretty sure that's progress. We abolished the slave trade, both of the Barbary slave trade and the Atlantic slave trade. That's pretty considerable progress. Um, MC International, there are more slaves today then pick a point in human history. There are more slaves alive today. Women are at more risk, not less. It doesn't matter how many people are alive on the planet. More women are at risk of their lives right now in human history. Pop, are you familiar with the Stanford, if we shrunk the whole world to a village of 100 people? Yeah. You, the Stanford study, they've done it four times. If you take all the world demographics and you shrink the world to a village of 100 people, 60% uh, um, of that is an abject poverty. Yeah. Right. So I'm not seeing the moral progress or am as enthusiastic about it as you are, not with a person who has worked for women's rights. It's at, an, it's at a fairly low ebb and flow. I mean, if you go to places like 
my goodness, uh, India, um, most parts of Africa, uh, go to the, so if you go to the Soviet Union, right, Russia right now, and ask how LGBTQ rights are, ask Brittany Griner, who's in a penal colony right now, how that, so I don't see this overwhelming moral progress that you're excited about. I think each one of the points that you made, I just don't think the facts are bearing this out. I mean, at adequate medical care, most of the world, Tom, does not have adequate access to medical care. Maybe the industrialized nations, and thank goodness for the United States, but most of the world does not have access to, to adequate medical care. Well, I, I don't quite understand your argument here. It seems like you're saying bad things still happen, therefore it hasn't been getting better. And that's I, that doesn't, it's not quite how it works. Clearly bad things still happen, and there are more people for those bad things to happen too. But like, for example, the EU made a policy to try to cut poverty in half in 20 years, and they did. Those people that you mentioned in poverty, the 60%, if it wasn't for the intervention and invention of many different scientific revolutions, like Norman Borlaug inventing the man who saved a billion lives, inventing genetically modified wheat and rice, um, all of those people would be dead. They wouldn't be alive right now. So mm -hmm. the fact that they're alive, that's that's progress. Um, and if we take LGBTQ rights, the vast majority of European countries now have rights for those people, which they didn't before, before they used to be lynched and killed for no reason, and it was perfectly legal. That isn't the case anymore. So I agree that there are still bad things that happen, but the question is, is, is the rate going down? Is the percent per capita decreasing? And all of the evidence in every academic paper that study this says yes, definitively, everywhere in the world. Saudi Arabia just made it legal for women to drive recently. There is progress being made here. Right. Uh, we, hey, we need to do part two on that. I'd love to do a whole conversation on the state of the world. Sure. That'd be kind of cool. But listen, for the sake of time, let me jump to another epistemic surprise. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I really, I really feel for this one. So, um, if you take a look at Peter Berger, one of the top um, cultural anthropologists, he makes an interesting observation about human desire for justice. He says, in our outrage, we long for judgment of supernatural dimensions. In other words, we are not content with just mere human justice. For example, take Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. But notice Dylan Roof, the Charleston church shooter, who killed nine people uh, while they stood praying with their eyes closed. Uh, in, uh, family impact statements. Uh, one woman articulately said, may you rot in hell. Berger says it is interesting in culture that we see human justice, but there's a desire for supernatural justice to take place. I find that fascinating, uh, Peter Berger's observation, that there's a longing for something else rather than just human justice. Sure, I'm not seeing why that again would be a surprise. I mean, I would long for eternal life as well. And most people would, I imagine. Um, the fact that it's, again, a desire humans have to have more um, is not particularly surprising. And since they can't, typically it's easier to imagine living eternally when you're not stuck in a watery meat sack. And so positing a soul to, soul to help you be able to survive, souls being non-material, wouldn't necessarily have the same constraints as physical bodies that die and decay. You would imagine, people would want to imagine they have this thing that makes them invincible and immortal as opposed to being stuck in these bodies, which is a fairly common belief. And so, again, this, this belief that you're talking about, this longing for more, doesn't seem to be particularly surprising any more than I long for a longer life or more money or more happiness or whatever. But Tom, interesting that, that it isn't just the longing for life. That, that would make sense. I mean, I, I get that. But why create gods that are judgmental and have eternal expectations? And if we're going to create gods, Let's create gods that are more uh, feeding into the pleasure principle. Why create gods that, um, I, I, yeah. Well, okay. we did, we, we created all kinds of gods, but unfortunately, um, because the way the human brain works, there's a number of different studies that have shown that when people think they're talking to a god, it operates the part of the brain that is active when you're asking yourself questions. And so the gods that were more relatable, that were accepted by groups of people, happened to be the kind that were 
more like human nature, more like the warlike nature. And so the preponderance of gods who were violent was more relatable for people. And it also had a built-in spreading mechanism, which was convert or die. And so the, the violent religions of the Abrahamic faith were much more popular and successful than, for example, the Jain faith, which is purely nonviolent. Because they were spread in a much more violent way, it was more relatable to people. They could use it to control those under them. They had lots of different um, hedonistic vices that were benefited by adopting this kind of religion as opposed to one that is purely nonviolent and peaceful. Because those kinds of gods do exist. There are many of them in history, but they're not as popular because they don't um, fit the human narrative as well. They aren't as relatable. Hey, let me just... Uh... I'm going to skip this real quick for the sake of time because you graciously said you're going to come in to uh, my class. So let me just close with three thoughts that I've wrestled with that I think might be helpful to people who might be finding themselves in a middling position, let's say. Uh, what do you do if you find yourself riding the fence? Is there danger of remaining on the fence? And how do we best continue this conversation? Let me throw out three thoughts real quick and get your thoughts on them. Number one, I would say don't let the urgency of this conversation fade away. Like life is just crazy and we get caught in a, man, a tsunami of technology, busyness. And though we're focusing on this conversation right now, it's just easy for it to recede into the background. Um, I think we should keep it at the foreground. And that's what I love about your station, Tom. There, we, we ought to be having more of these conversations, not less. But I get that we get caught up in the hustle and bustle of life. So I'm a huge Pascal fan. I know you've done whole um, episodes on Pascal. But to me, Pascal works for me in this sense. That, that the first option is to bet that God does exist and live a life of devotion. Right? If you are wrong and God doesn't exist, then you've not really lost anything and you've actually lived a virtuous life. So Tom, I believe in the second great commandment, treat uh, your neighbor as you would treat yourself. I'm married to a Christian woman. I have three Christian kids. I am fortunate enough to teach at a Christian university that actually um, we have the largest homeless population in the United States, Skid Row, and we regularly try to help people. I think at the end of the day, I've lived a, a life of meaning for sure, and I've lived a virtuous life. And if there is no God, when I die, I honestly won't know that. Like, I, I will be six feet under and not aware that the narrative that led me to virtuous acts was one that in reality didn't exist. But I think I'm okay. But man, what Pascal says, though, that I think is fascinating, and it ticks people off, Tom. It really does. It's the second option. But if you bet that God doesn't exist, and if you are wrong and he does, then you'll miss out on heaven and experience perhaps eternal separation from God and all that you have. I, I'm not arguing in any way, shape or form that atheists can't live good purposeful lives. Man, I have atheist friends who absolutely do that. But if what I'm saying is true, there are eternal consequences and maybe there's something about this life that you're missing out on. Like we all long for love, could there be divine love? So the only reason I bring up, and again, Tom, I, I listened to your episodes where you actually tackled Pascal's wager. I just bring it up to say, let's keep this at the forefront of our conversations, because if Pascal is right, there are consequences to your bet that could possibly extend into the afterlife and have, have uh, eternal repercussions, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll give you a comment because I know you don't like the wager, so I'll well, give you a comment to jump in. I find it very entertaining, that's for sure. So the problem with Pascal's wager is that he assumes it's more likely that there's a heaven with a god than without a god, and that's false. So the probability of there being a heaven without a god is exactly the same as the probability of there being a heaven with a god. There are conceivable kinds of gods that don't have heaven. Some of the Greek and Roman gods, for example, don't don't allow you into heaven. They don't have heavens. And some versions of gods do have heavens. Some versions of atheism, like physical naturalism, doesn't have a heaven. Some versions of naturalism do have a heaven, um, such as the fields and Buddhas, Buddhism and other kinds of those kinds of religions that have these kinds of just universal fields that have an afterlife. And so 
any particular action that you do or belief that you have, whether you believe in Christianity or believe in Buddhism, has a percent chance of getting you into heaven of a particular God. But the same applies under atheism. So you can say that there is a field of atheism that only allows skeptics uh, who only follow the evidence into heaven or whatever. And so if this is the case, and if it has the exact same probability as Christianity being true, then you're equally as likely to get into heaven if you adopt the atheist position as if you adopt the Christian position. So the reason Pascal's rager is wrong is because the probability of a heaven existing with any particular criteria to get into heaven is exactly the same under atheism as it is under Christianity. Um, and so until we actually have some solid evidence to indicate one way or the other, Pascal's wager is simply a incorrect argument. Oh, but, but remember that's Bakhtin. I've already evoked Bakhtin in the beginning, and I do think there's ample evidence for God's existence be the cosmological, ontological, teleological argument for desire. But Tom, here's my... Well, just, just, I did want to bring up one thing there. Pascal's wager was meant by Pascal to be an argument that could be invoked without evidence. It's a, supposed to be a reason that you should believe without evidence. And so even if you include the other evidences, that kind of invalidates the point of Pascal's wager. So the reason Pascal's wager is wrong is because before considering evidence, the probabilities are exactly the same on equal sides. Oh, but let me, okay, so let me push back just a little bit. The cool thing about being at a university, uh, one of my friends, Professor Asian, did her PhD in Pascal. Who knew? So I took her off for coffee and got an education. Um, so Pascal is saying reason cannot decide this. It, it simply cannot do it. So now we have to make a decision that reason can't decide because if we appeal to reason, it's the biggest no-brainer bet in the world. You would bet on God because of the cost-benefit analysis of the wager, right? So Tom, the only reason I evoke the wager right now is this, keep this conversation alive because it has consequences and those consequences may be eternal consequences. That's all I'm saying is kind of giving props to your station in a way of saying, don't let this recede in the background, keep it alive because we're betting our lives one way or the other when it comes to these very important issues such as the existence of a God. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I do want to clarify that Pascal was wrong when he said that you should bet God because the consequences would be greater. That's the part I was objecting to. You could have equally as much infinite reward under atheism as you do under God. And so there's no probabilistic difference of betting on God versus betting on atheism. Um, and so what you should do is wait for evidence and until then pursue what makes you happy and what you get fulfillment from in life, regardless of whether or not it's God or atheism or whatever. And don't worry about the eternal consequences until there's actually evidence to indicate one way or the other. But I would just say, remember, I'm, I'm kind of speaking right now to the middle people, the people on the fence that do look at this and say, you know, I, I kind of can see both. I'm sort of seeing both. That bald headed guy's kind of winsome in some ways. Um, that's who I'm talking to is people on the fence. So let me give you major props to you with my second suggestion, Tom. And let me just mention right now, Tom does not in any way give me any merchandise to say any of this stuff, right, Tom? Uh, we'll keep that under the table. Ah, I love it. Here's my second one. And, I, and I'm not just saying this to say this, Tom. Keep researching this topic. Like, like keep doing it. So I've been impressed with the people that you've had on your channel. And for sure, keep consulting your channel. I would just add another channel to kind of have the two be speaking to each other. Do you know Sean McDowell, Dr. Sean McDowell? I've emailed him multiple times. He has also refused to come on my channel. So ah! if, you can, if you can guilt him into it, I'd appreciate it. You know what? I'm actually writing a book with him. Oh, nice. Um, it's called Engage One Another, Moving Past the Cancel Culture. So uh, I may try to get an endorsement from you, Tom. Absolutely. I've actually met him. I went to because there's a conference held up here, the Re-Apologetics Conference, where Sean and Greg Kokel and those guys come oh. down every year. So I've met pretty much all those guys. Oh, great. Good. Well, listen, I'm honest. Uh, I'm sincere when I say keep listening to your station. But then Sean kind of does what you're trying to do. He just does it from a Christian perspective. But he brings on regularly people who disagree with him. Um, and I'll talk to him. I, I, I will. I will mention uh, you to him. Absolutely appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, number three. We'll end with this. Um, I'm. I'm a big fan of cutting out the middle person, Tom. 
So if my view is correct and there's a guy, then I would say to a listener who's on the fence, this is between you and God. And if my God exists, God loves you and is pursuing you. So I, there's something called the skeptic's prayer. Again, this comes from Peter Kraft from that great book, Does God Exist? The Debate Between Kai Nielsen and J.P. Moreland. He says, go into your backyard tonight and say, God, I don't know if you exist or not. I suspect I'm only talking to the night sky, but I'm not sure. So if you exist, you must hear me now and know me and know my heart. So please let me know that you are real somehow in your own way, in your own time. I'm open and ready if you are, right? And, and to me, there's a beauty to that. Uh, and this is, I think, Pascal at his best is how do you put yourself in the position of a seeker? And Pascal would say things like, read the Bible. Um, you can read other things, but read the Bible. I have times of prayer. I would go to religious services, right? Um, and I get the other God's objection to the wager. I get that. But, so I'm not saying limited to Christianity, right? But to keep this going, that I would invite God to respond and cut out the middle person. So, so, and again, how long would this prayer take? I don't know how important is the issue to you. It seems to me it would it'd be good to dedicate months to this and not just give it a one shot in the backyard so that's years years would be good which is what most atheists have done they spent years praying uh, yeah and tom kudos to you you how long have you been doing this uh channel full time for five years longer than that started doing gaming first see i think that's i think that's exceptional and i commend you for doing that and uh you've already agreed to be on our podcast the Winsome Conviction podcast, so we'll let people know. But Tom, just know that'd be the pinnacle of your career, coming on the Winsome Conviction podcast. Um, hey, listen, I just want to sincerely thank you. Um, what the listeners don't know is that we've had an audience the entire time, and that is one of my communication classes uh, here at Biola University who have been studying uh, persuasion, and uh, they've all been listening in. They're all going to write a paper on this, Tom. Um, and you're going to actually, we're going to stop the recording right now, and you're going to actually jump in and engage them, see what kind of questions they have for you, which is very gracious of you. So I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, who's been listening, both on the Biola side, the Wisdom Conviction Project, but also for Tom. Uh, please check out Tom's channel. What's the best way that they can get a hold of your stuff, Tom? Uh, YouTube.com slash T-Jump. Great. Uh, hey, Tom, honestly, thank you for the conversation. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me on. Really appreciate it. If you want more information, please check out wisdomconviction.com. And there you, all the resources are for free. We just love for you to uh, check out what we're doing. We're trying to do things with civility, kindness, compassion, and have great conversations like this. But do it in a way that's inviting, not attacking. And uh, I think this has been a, a super conversation. So thank you so much. Let me just hit uh, stop the recording, Tom. And I'm still streaming. Is that okay? Or would you like me to stop streaming before it turns to the audience? You know what? I probably would say with my students not to have it go public. All right. Does that make sense? Because sure. yeah, that way we can have more of a. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And if I hit and you go away, I'm going to be so bummed out. But All right. I'll see, see you guys on my stream.